So yeah, bring colonial Africa into your game. This is the topic where to start an introduction. So I'm going to be, I'm assuming that uh, most or all of you haven't really dealt much with this topic before. And so I'll be starting from the beginning. Uh, so uh, the plan quickly is going to be why is this topic relevant? Why is you know looking into pre-colonial Africa and potentially getting into your game or your media an interesting or useful thing to do? Then I'm going to take you literally through a journey across the content that's going to be the biggest part of the presentation. And I'm going to be uh, like showing you examples of uh, what pre-colonial Africa looks like and how you can get inspiration from the continent. And then towards the end, I'm going to summarize how to research. So, you know, basically when you walk away from this presentation, how to uh, go on and keep on you know, working on this if you want to add some of it into your, your game or your media and how colonialism and neocolonialism influences this. We cannot avoid that topic. And then finally summarizing or summarize some takeaways uh, on the whole conversation. So uh, yeah, I'm Alan, uh, why me? So I'm half Italian and half Ghanaian. Uh, I've lived in both countries. I live in Germany currently, I'm based in Berlin. Uh, I work as a game designer. Uh, I started more in the business side. I, originally I was a more marketing for games uh, as a consultant. And then I switched to like 100% game design. I worked for um, uh, King uh, on the on some new games, some more hardcore games, prototyping. I worked on the Candy Crush franchise as well. And I worked for Wuga, focusing on more narrative-based games. Uh, and um, uh, they're based in Berlin. They're like one of the largest casual companies, casual gaming companies uh, yeah, here in the country. Now they, they're part of the of Playtica, this uh, large uh, mobile game conglomerate. I have this thing that when I join companies, they get bought. So Activision Blizzard bought King when I was there. So, so just to say, like, if you want me to work in your company, I'm good. it will get bought. But now I actually started my own company called Twin Drums. Since last year, it's an indie company. We're working on a PC game called the Wagadu Chronicles that actually takes inspiration from pre-colonial Africa. So this is a topic currently I'm not just personally interested in, as I've been in the past, but it's even professionally currently my focus. So I had an epiphany moment uh, a few years ago at a global game jam. So, I mean, for those of you maybe who haven't been before, you know, it's this uh, event where you get together and then you kind of create some games in a, in a weekend. It's very hectic and crazy and fun and amazing. And at uh, the, the beginning uh, of, the, um, uh, of the meeting, people were brainstorming and trying to find other members uh, of a team you know, to create a game. And I had this idea of uh, a girl in an African slum who goes around looking for fallen gods, like kind of like pieces of gods into this slum to awaken them. Hello, it sounds like someone joined, I think. <laughs> right, yes. And um, I'm Alan. And um, people were really taken aback. They were like, oh, wow, that sounds like a very serious game. I didn't want to work on a serious game. Or someone was like, oh, this is a sad game. And I was realizing, I didn't think, it's not like, Everybody who lives in a slum, I mean, people live in slums and have jobs and go to university and have shops and normal lives. So I realized there was, you know, a certain view of Africa that was affecting even the approach to games, you know, and, and in, in, a, in, a, in a situation such as a game jam. Then years later, working in an international large company, we're talking about a tutorial for a game or a role playing game. And then not me, another, another guy is like, oh, we can have like this black woman wizard who teaches you how to use the spells and stuff. And then a person at the meeting goes like a senior person, like, uh, wait, actually, I don't think we should have a black woman because people tend to associate white older men to wisdom and knowledge, not black women. And I was like, this, re this really happened? And again, you know, associations of Africa influencing game development within, you know, and I'm talking about companies even that have like, you know, very forward thinking with modern young people and so on. Again, other example, other company discussing like, oh, we need to add, I was like, we need to add some black people because like this whole set has only white people. And then someone in the team goes like, oh, but then less people would be interested in playing because you know that black people don't sell. And I'm like, okay, like the same price. It just comes up again and again and again. And, and I really thought, you know, I need to do something to start talking about this because otherwise, you know, these type of incidents will keep on happening. And uh, I think it's very inspiring. There's a very inspiring talk. Uh, you can find it on YouTube from Chimamanda and Gotia uh, the um, Nigerian writer. And she speaks about how very often Africa is portrayed as one story, the single story, she calls it. So, which is 
poverty, hunger, destruction, uh, savages, village, you know, people starving. And that's what subconsciously people have in their head. You know, sometimes it's conscious, but very, very many times it's just subconscious. So it's there. It affects everything, including us, including game developers, game development, and media, of course. And uh, that's why Black Panther has been so important. You know, I remember having a conversation um, with an acquaintance and he was like, yeah, but come on, the whole black thing is a bit of a marketing thing. And I'm like, no, it's not. Because we need this type of representation to be able to go back and walk into a room when someone says like, black people don't sell. Or like, you know, black people don't appear as wise or strong or, or whatever. So it's really important to have this type of representation uh, in, you know, in media. And as a game developer too, it gives you inspiration, like going to look at African cultures means visual inspiration because, you know, I, I often say that you know, cultures are like a color palette. So you have like, you know, green, blue, yellow, everything. And ignoring a culture, not, not looking into it, is like ignoring a color. It's like painting without red. Like, yeah, I don't know much about red, so I'm going to paint without red. Like, whereas if you ask a painter, it's like, you should learn about red because your paintings are going to look better if you use all colors. And, you know, humans are developed in different parts of the world with all of these interesting cultures that were iterated throughout thousands of years and ignoring some of them is a pity. And sadly, African cultures are possibly the, you know, one of the most ignored cultures and, you know, you're missing out on a color. Uh, music as well, you know, like, there's so much coming out of black music both, of course, African diaspora, but on the continent as well. Stories, you know, we don't hear a lot about epic stories, myth, history, but there's a lot across the continent. And even mechanics, like some of the, uh, for instance, there's a famous game called Oware, it's like a board game. And uh, I remember actually with another name, I think Nokia had a game about it, which was really cool at the time, if you think about it, but not many people have looked at you know, African games or, or, or mythology and history to come up with mechanics, which is something interesting. And even if you think about the impact that uh, Tolkien, uh, and therefore Christ Tolkien was very Catholic, so Christianity had on, on fantasy and games, the whole idea of good versus evil, which is very specifically Christian thing. So the devil and God, demons and angels, it has affected mechanics a lot. So even like the morality mechanics, dialogue mechanics in games are affected by, you know, through fantasy, Christianity, if you look at different types of uh, morality, like for instance, Shintoism and the uh, spirits, uh, I don't know, in Japan, that can affect mechanics in different ways because the way you uh, speak with spirit NPCs in some games is not how you speak with angels and demons. You cannot expect to turn a demon into your friend, but you can do that with a tree spirit maybe in a Japanese ancient magical world. So this side, you know, like we look at, you know, most video games you look at out there, or dare say all of them have, at least to some extent, inspiration from uh, cultures, right? And uh, often it's like the history of, of these cultures. So you look at Skyrim, of course, you know, Norse, Northern European history. Uh, even Candy Crush, you know, many people don't realize, but it has like this massive uh, background, you know, and I know for sure because I worked on it. And, you know, like the, if you look at it, you start realizing that this consistent world inspired by the, the 50s in the West, and everything emanates from this. And even some of the mechanics emanate from this. So again, it's really important to have like some cultural inspirations and be aware of them because we all do, but often we're not aware of them and we just pick them like, you know, by default. And that's sad because then you're not challenging yourself. You're not doing something interesting. And if you put a bit of effort, you can come up with really cool stuff. Like Never Alone, for instance, is a game that is uh, both on PC and mobile. Uh, I don't know if any of you has uh, played it. It was uh, you know, quite successful and it's, uh, inspired by Inuit uh, mythology. So the, the developers went to a bunch of elder Inuit people and went to interview them about legends and story and stuff and they studied the visual art and everything and the language and came up with this game about this girl with a white fox uh, in the you know North Pole that is uh, struggling with a curse and so on. And it's really beautiful and it's actually memorable. I remember it because of the cultural influences and art style. And even a casual game, like really, really puzzly, maybe some of you have played it, uh, Zuma Deluxe, you know, kind of this frog that spits balls and you have to uh, a bit, um, kind of, you know, beat the levels uh, by spitting balls. And um, it's inspired by, you know, Central America, like pre-Columbian um, uh, graphics and, and cultures and aesthetics. And this makes it memorable. For me, this is more memorable than just a random frog. And there's something really cool about the visuals of this frog and of the rock buildings and everything. 
So going back to Africa, I think one thing always I want to remind people is I look at the map. This is like the traditional Mercatore map that we know. And uh, actually this map is politics. This map is fake. Like it was created by Europeans, you know, Mercatore uh, after the Middle Ages. And it's a stretching of the globe that actually makes Europe look a bit bigger. Uh, but actually, if you use the Peter Gals projection, which is much more accurate surface wise, you will realize all of a sudden that Europe is much smaller, which it is, it's just a fact. And there's this continent in the middle, which is massive, really, really big. You cannot ignore it anymore. I think even, even maps, you know, have been reinforcing these stereotypes that we have. It's like, oh, you know, Africa doesn't matter. We should focus on, on Europe or the rest or wherever, you know, you want to focus on. If you look at the real size of Africa, this is how big it is. You can have China, USA, most of Europe and India inside. So it's really, really big. And uh, if you're ignoring it, you're ignoring a big part of the world. And uh, it, interesting examples, The Economist, biggest uh, magazine for um, within the economy world. Uh, in the 2000s, the hopeless continent, you know, devastation, the single story, you know, the one story that Shimamanda speaks about. And then 2011 and 13, whoops, they start changing their mind. They realize something is happening. Africa is rising. So this move is happening. People in other sectors as well are realizing, hey, we should look at Africa. So, you know, gaming should look as well, you know, it's, if even econo economists are doing this. And this is just a few data. I'm not going to stop. It's even a bit outdated, but, you know, it's even a growing market as well. So there's even potentially business reasons if you're making a game to want to think of this part of, this world, of the world. So I'm going to get into the journey now and actually go through uh, Africa and uh, show you a bit of different parts of the continent and give you like a basis where to start for your future research. And um, I'll start just briefly talking about world building in general, uh, because often when we talk about settings, you know, we're thinking about you know, science fiction or fantasy and you know, Tolkien is very, very relevant. And one thing that's very important to say about Tolkien and Middle Earth is how he did it ton of research like really one thing is sad because most people just copy the results so we look at fantasy and we think of elves dwarves so on and copy this but actually what we should be copying is the methodology like the amount of effort that he spent in trying to create something interesting and new so this word sigelwara i'm not sure how to read it in the middle is just like some strange old english word that he found and then he started building up theories and stuff about like how this word was created and he came up with whole the Cimmerillion and the World Balrog and everything came from this word. So we were just spending lots of time researching real old English um, and other parts of Europe mythology and then and, and history and language, especially he was into languages and then coming up with something that was really original and cool. So he didn't go and just copy paste someone else's uh, you know, fantasy work. I do want to mention as well that uh, it's something important again for when talking about Africa that there is a racist bias as well. So here you can read squat, broad, flat nosed, sallow skinned, with wide mouths and slant eyes. In fact, degraded, repulsive versions of the Europeans, least lovely Mongol types. So it's, he's describing someone has very, very ugly, Asian looking, and he's speaking about orcs. So in a letter, this is how, you know, and he didn't consider himself a racist. And he even tried sometimes not to be racist, like when he was, uh, he opposed to publishing his books in Germany during Nazi time. But in the end, the racism was just so thick, so intense that it, it filtered through. So that's another reason to try and look a bit at other cultures because a lot of the media we currently consume coming from fantasy or so on has a racist root as well. And this talking topic, you can go more in depth on the internet, there's even more, sadly. If you think about it, you know, good people are always very light skinned and very Western. And then the humans who are like from the South, they're allied with Sauron and so on. It's like somewhere in the subconscious but you know dark foreign is evil and bright uh, bright blonde is kind of good and pure uh, again george martin uh, another famous example of uh, recent world building uh, you know game of thrones is heavily inspired by the war of the roses so like uh, english history so again really important to look at uh, you know to make a create an interesting world even fantasy look at real world you know do some research it will make your media you, i'm looking in this case at books but then of course games as well more interesting so as i said go wide uh, so i'm going to use a bit of a thought process for this journey what if aliens came here and they wanted to make a game uh, on europe on europe with like some sort of european fantasy uh, theme in it like how would you explain European fantasy uh, or European cultures to some aliens? 
So they, this alien, assuming it's a similar intelligence uh, like us or lack of intelligence, would look at the map and go like, oh my God, there's so many countries, I don't know where to start, which happens to lots of people when they're researching. So maybe you can tell them, okay, look at population density. That's a good place to start for, to understand where, which cultures to focus on. You look at, oh, okay, I can see that uh, this kind of half moon, like kind of Italy, Germany, France, uh, um, you know, Great Britain have a lot of people. So those cultures must, must be really important to understand the history of Europe. Yeah, and that actually is the case. Hello. And, um, and then if you look a bit back in history, just revert a few, like, you know, a couple of centuries ago, uh, states were bigger. You look at historical empires, that helps as well. You look at, okay, so Austria-Hungary, Germany, uh, Great Britain, it's just a bit simplified. This is another way, so looking historically at historical empires really helps to break down cultures within a continent and start getting a, getting a better grasp where to start focusing on. So again, nothing against Estonia, but you rather want to focus on learning a bit about Germany rather than Estonia if you know nothing about Europe. Another useful one is languages, even broader. If you, if you break Europe into language groups, have like the kind of Latin-based languages, uh, like, you know, France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, there's something that connects them, right? Then you have the Germanic languages. You look at uh, uh, German, uh, Dutch, English, the Nordic languages. So, you know, if you look at the um, uh, mythology of the Nordic countries, Thor, Odin, so on, you realize, and then you look at the Southern European, like the Latin mythology, and so you've started breaking them, that was Slavic mythology. You have three groups, basically, that you can use to have uh, understand the basics of European mythology. Slavic, Germanic, Latin mythology. Okay, so compared to the first map with all those countries, what that was a bit scary, these aliens now have a better time where to start. So for Africa, the same, you look at this map, more than 50 countries, very overwhelming. Oh my God, where do I start? I don't know how to research uh, African history and cultures. Then you look at population density and you see, okay, interesting. The West of Africa has a lot of density. North Africa, Egypt, you're like, okay, something important must have happened in Egypt. Look at all those people there. And of course, Egypt was one of the most relevant civilizations ever. You look at on the east, uh, the Lake, Great Lakes, uh, Ethiopia, and then South Africa, kind of, that's actually the area where, for instance, the Zulus were. So, okay, uh, you look at, uh, let's look at uh, historical empires as well, as we did for Europe. And ta-da, as you can see, they tend to overlap with population density. So now you don't have just a massive map with like tons of states, and you don't know where to start. You have like, some focus, you know, like West Africa is very important, North Africa, and then you know, some parts in the East, South, Southeast, you can focus on these or at least one of these. And uh, I'm not going to focus that much on North Africa. And the reason is that already we know a lot about it. It's like one of the most represented or the most represented part of Africa, Egypt. It's so represented that some people don't even connect it to Africa anymore, which is sad. Uh, and it shows a bit the bias as well. But so I'm not going to stop on it. There's a lot of material, and I think uh, lots of media have done a good job at portraying Africa, uh, of uh, North Africa, apart from the fact that Egyptians are white very often, and no Egyptians were not white. There were different shades of color, a bit lighter or darker skin, but they were not white, they were not blonde. Um, so brief shout out just to the Berber, like when you're looking at North Africa, don't think just about Arab cultures, There's a, you know, which are the most uh, well-known cultures in North Africa. But there's the Berbers as well, which are like the indigenous people of North Africa and the language is still alive. Many people still identify as Berbers, especially in the Maghreb, Algeria, Morocco. And they even have like a really ancient language, a really ancient alphabet, which is different from the Arabic and uh, they have their own mythology and ancient queen and so on. So have a look if you're interested. So I'm going to move a bit south and start with the Sahel region, which is basically the stripe uh, that is between uh, North Africa and the rest of Africa. And this uh, image is from uh, uh, Mansa Musa. It's like the first, like what, not the first, but like the most famous probably king of, uh, of the Sahel, of, uh, of Mali, the kingdom of Mali. And he was, according to some research, the richest man who ever lived, ever, like more than Bill Gates. So he was so rich that when he traveled to Egypt uh, in a visit with his caravan, he had so much gold with him that he literally broke the economy of Egypt. The, the economy went in inflation and collapsed. He created a financial crisis because he, pulled, he put so much gold into the economy. So again, we have one story of Africa being a poor place, but then if you start digging, you see, oh, the richest king, king of the world ever lived, uh, ever lived was in Africa, and you travel with so much wealth that you'd break the economy of the countries where he ended up. And um, Timbuktu was one of the cities, you might have heard this name, of, uh, of this part of the continent. And um, uh, it was a city famous for its university. 
is still full of books and uh, and it has like again you know people often don't associate pre-colonial africa to books timbuktu one of the biggest universities of the middle ages taught thousands and thousands of manuscripts they're still there the one in the picture is one of the scholars of Timbuktu in Mali reading one of the manuscripts that probably has hundreds of years. Fun fact, uh, research was done a couple of years ago in the UK. Students were asked if Timbuktu was uh, real or mythical. Most students said it's not real, that Timbuktu doesn't exist. It's just a myth. So again, I will say it here for everyone, Timbuktu exists. It's in Africa, it's not a myth. Uh, that this is uh, architecture, by the way, you saw another image before. Uh, architecturally, white is really fascinating as well. The type of mud, this is all made of mud, basically, and, and wood and mud. And uh, it's, it's a very specific type of architecture called Sahelio Sudanese. And uh, have a look at it, it can be great inspiration as well if you're looking for a different type of buildings that are not just the usual European medieval style. For, uh, for stories and myths, uh, Sundiata's epic is for, uh, an ancient epic from the Middle Ages really cool with like wizard kings and, and uh, goddesses that help you in the lake and fighters and, and knights and everything. And it's based in Mali. So really, uh, or pre, you know, kind of the kingdoms before Mali. Have a look, you can read all of it. It survived, it does those ancient texts. And, you know, we all always know about the Odyssey and, you know, King Arthur and so on. Look at Sundiata as well. There's even YouTube videos that if you don't feel like reading that summarize it very nicely. Music too, awesome. Again, like, you know, when we think about black people music, often it's the US. Don't forget that there's Africa as well. And Mali is especially known for its music. So it's really, uh, she's one of my favorite uh, Malian artists, Fatumata Diawara. And she does like just great music, even just to play on Spotify as a background. Uh, and of course, to inspire potentially different music for your game. I mentioned Mali. Mali is a modern country as well. It still exists. Uh, and I think what's fascinating too, that in a place like Mali, you have like this kind of center of learning, Muslim, uh, Timbuktu scholars, you know, with these long robes and hats and ancient kingdoms. And then you have other people, like this mask is a Dogon mask. These are people that live still in Mali, but in the highlands. And uh, they're very different. They don't believe in Islam. They have their own religion with ancestors and gods and the, the stars that they worship. The villages look very different from the great cities of uh, Timbuktu or Jen. Uh, and they live in this plateau hidden. And this is an example of how a Dogon dance looks. This is an ancestral dance. And it's very, diff it's very different from going to a mosque, of course. So you have, you know, on the lowlands, people going to mosques, uh, places of worship. And on the highlands, you have, you had, and you still have people living, you know, dancing with masks and worshiping ancestors. And so it, this is just an example to show you how with, even within states, you have massive differences. Imagine if in Germany, you had kind of like Christians, I don't know, living in Bavaria and you go to church. And then somehow in, uh, I don't know, Baden-Württemberg, the people living in the mountains, worshiping ancestors and kind of dancing with masks. This is how crazy it would look like. Like you have really wide varieties because Africa is so big and it's, you know, there's, it's, it's so diverse, it's a very, very diverse continent, so something to keep in mind. And specifically, uh, like, uh, and there are references were random, it just came up, so no specific offense for any part, anyone in Southern Germany. And um, uh, this uh, specific uh, example shows like how, for instance, Islam and traditional African religions kind of collided. That's one of the themes to when you're looking into pre-colonial Africa, often Islam is kind of trying to go south and influencing uh, the rest of Africa, and then traditional religions are kind of pushing back in some way. And even the epic of Sundiata that I mentioned often has these themes of like wizard kings, Muslim prince, and so on. And that happened in Europe as well. You know, if you think about King Arthur, you have a lot of these pre-Christian kind of witches and wizards and spells and so on. And then the church kind of like, you know, being uh, opposing and a bit like, sometimes it's not super visible because it's a bit hidden, but if you dig into it, you see this contrast happening for Christianity and in Europe as well. Uh, this is just a shout out to a place called Kong, uh, ancient uh, city and kingdom in the Sahel, modern Ivory Coast. This is a fascinating example because they had actually Muslim uh, princes coexisting with a uh, traditional religion believing military and Christian visitors, and they were all in peace. So again, like very multicultural uh, and interesting societies that were there. This got destroyed, uh, unfortunately, at the end of the 19th century. So this is uh, the main uh, West African kingdoms that I showed before. 
By the way, uh, I was saying with Linus before, feel free to interrupt me if you have questions because I'm bombarding you with information. <laughs> so you can block any time. Again, the goal is to give you a glimpse of everything. Uh, so you can do more research later, but if you have questions straight away, uh, please feel free to interrupt me. So I'm going to quickly go through uh, some other of these kingdoms to give you an introduction. Asante Kingdom, you can see it. Can I point things? I don't know if that's a, a possible. No, I don't know how to do it. So anyways. Yeah, see. We, we see your mouse. So. mouse uh, awesome. So like this here. Thank you. So this is Asante Kingdom, uh, more or less modern day Ghana. This uh, symbol is uh, actually is a large uh, golden, uh, it's on, on a golden chain, and it's called a soul washer. Uh, it used to be worn by people who were born. Yes, just because this is a video game about someone who's like a soul washer, like you're born the same day as the king, and your soul is bound to the king, and you can basically, you know, protect him or her in, in the, if the queen in some way. This is like some examples of Ashanti architecture, this, you know, very powerful kingdom. And uh, again, you know, like, look, these are like British people who took pictures because they were fascinated by what they find. This was in the middle of the jungle. So they just went to the jungle and they found like the picture on the right is like one of the, of the halls of the royal, of the imperial palace. And there was even toilets and sewages and everything. So like really, you know, and, and different rooms and uh, lots of halls with gardens. So uh, you can see even the arabesques, you can barely notice, but really interesting patterns with history. And so they had the library, there was a library here as well. So again, Black Africa, books. That's one association that people often don't have. They think, you know, that scriptures and books and so on are not something that are connected to Africa. This is another example of Owes Kumasi. Uh, this was a mausoleum where all the skeletons of the previous emperors were held. And once a year, they'd go and meet the skeletons. And this was kind of a powerful magic spell that protected them. The tree in front of, the, of this mausoleum uh, was sacred. Uh, and the, there's a bowl, can you see like here in front? It's like a brass bowl that was used for ceremonies to kind of call the ancestors and it's really interesting. And this place was old centuries. This is a centuries old temple. So again, fantasy, if you think about fantasy, magic, world building, these are interesting things to look at. But this is a picture of this just a couple of years later, end of 19th century, British expedition. The whole of Kumasi got burned by the ground by the British. So this is a reason to, to explain why we don't see, why it's so hard to find a lot of these cultures because Colonialism meant that British or French or Germans so went there and destroyed everything to rebuild colonies that looked like their own country, right? So here Kumasi got burned to the ground. So most African, most Ghanaians don't even know anymore how Kumasi looked like. So imagine like Paris or France, in France or London or I don't know, Rome being burned to the ground. Everything, Eiffel Tower, Colosseum, so on, gone. How would we perceive Europe? How would we perceive European history, right? So that's something to keep in mind. That's a big challenge. This is an example of the royal, this is the actual royal court of the emperor of the Shanti. You can see gold. Uh, it's it's a very, I'll show you some other royal courts later, very different aesthetics with, within the, the continent. Uh, this is another exa this example of scriptures. So the Adinkra symbols is a bit like Chinese symbols, but there are less of them. And they were used uh, to communicate messages, especially within royalty. So uh, they're still used a bit, uh, although like more like decorations. And again, you're looking for some interesting scripts that can be an inspiration. Moving on, Dahomey Kingdom. So this is just next to, can you see here, next to the Shanti Kingdom, a smaller one. Uh, I'm just going to mention one thing of them. They had actual Amazons. So this is a real picture, a real photo of a battalion of women, Amazons, who fought to protect the king of Dahomey. They had like really high status uh, and were very powerful. They would even be generals and uh, you know, uh, highly decorated. And they existed until a hundred years ago when the French came in and then they disbanded, they, 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 they conquered and disbanded this. So I even heard there were rumors they wanted to make a film with Lupita Nyong'o. I heard, I, I hope they do it because it'd be really cool. So again, you think about Amazons, like looking for inspiration where they're real Amazons till a hundred years ago in West Africa. Uh, moving on, Yoruba kingdoms here, uh, can you see on the right? Uh, this is very interesting because uh, the Yorubas had like very powerful kingdoms with very powerful royal families. So you can see on the left, uh, this is just one side of a royal palace. And if you look on the right, you can see the whole map of a palace. This is not specifically the biggest palace, just a palace, I could find a map on a book. Couldn't find anything online, I had to look on a book, uh, which is something we're going to talk about later. And you can see when you think about palace intrigue, you think about Versailles, 
uh, you think about European palaces, maybe the Forbidden City in China, you don't think about an African palace. Look at this map and you realize you can easily make a whole game around, you know, intrigue and uh, you know, royal uh, drama in, in a Yoruba palace. This is an interesting, interesting example. This is uh, Yoruba art from the Middle Ages. It was a German explorer called Frobenius uh, who discovered it at the beginning of the last century. When he found this, you know, think about European medieval art, very stylized, often very grotesque. This looks like classical art. It looks like literally like a Greek statue, right? When he saw this and he, like what he said was like, it cannot be that Africans made this. So he said that probably Greeks went all the way to modern day Nigeria, made a colony, they created these statues and then disappeared. That was his only way to justify how this could exist. So, and this type of mentality of like erasing African cultures is one of the reasons, again, why we are not making many games inspired by African cultures. And we look at uh, Western, like European, especially in sometimes, you know, East, East Asian, but never African cultures. Another interesting thing to uh, notice about the Yorubas is mythology. So this is a modern representation of the Pantheon. If you think about Greek mythology, the Yorubas have basically the same, if not more, like a lot of gods with their tradition, with the with the legends and the conflicts and love. Very, very fascinating if you start reading about it. This is an example of a temple. Uh, there's very, very few left nowadays, so uh, it's an illustration. Look at how interesting the, the pillars are, you know, like uh, all carved one by one. Uh, and this is a modern day ceremony. There's still people who believe, some people who believe uh, in uh, the Orishas. And this is on the right, is like a priest of the Shango, the Orisha of thunder, lightning, fire, and war. And he fights always with a uh, battle axe. So can you see the priest? Like every, every god has its own priesthood that have different colors. So Shango has red. The hairstyle too is related to Shango. And can you see the axe he's holding inside? You can tell straight away, okay. This is a priest warrior of Shango, of the god of thunder. And to be honest, like, it's not too different from some other, you know, god of thunder that we might have in European mythology. So again, if you're thinking god of thunder, does it always have to be this European one? Or can we think about another one? Maybe put an axe and change a bit the looks and it's something new. But, you know, there's, there's, if you start digging out there, there's other ways. We don't always have to use the same stereotypes. And people might remember it even better. And a small fun fact, uh, Orisha worship exists in Brazil as well. So this uh, uh, picture is from Brazil because many, when the slaves got brought to Brazil, they brought the religion and there's still people who believe in the Orisha. So you're not just exploring African cultures, in this case, exploring South American cultures as well. So moving on to the Benin kingdom. Uh, this is really famous for its bronzes. So this is um, material, uh, basically bronze and uh, cast that were made in the Middle Ages. Uh, look at the one on the right, very refined, very uh, beautiful art. This is the city of Benin. It was known for having like massive walls. This is carvings from Europeans. You know, when Europeans say something is massive and powerful, then it really is because, you know, they had to overcome the prejudice, like these are not Christians, these are not whites, but still they were very powerful. And this is an example of how the palace of the uh, king of Benin, the Oba of Benin, look like. And um, uh, this is the uh, royal court of the uh, King of Benin. This is a recent picture from the uh, last century. And I look at the difference between the previous court I showed you, all gold, and this one is all red. So again, keep in mind, similar region, West Africa, very different aesthetics. So white and red, uh, they look almost like cardinals, like some of them, right? And then gold and colorful cloths for the Shanti kingdom. So, if you start digging, there's a lot of variety, lots of different things you do. So if you want to create even two different factions or colors of people for your game, even just within West Africa, you can find a lot of variety. Keep this in mind. This is uh, for within the palace where ancestors um, kind of worship altars. I'm showing this uh, because again, it's like really cool how they have these bronzes and you don't see it very well, but it's like uh, elephant tusks uh, that are coming out from top and they're all carved. Uh, and um, I think it's, a, it's an interesting anecdote. I was, I've been playing the last days on Zoom with a friend as a way to reconnect uh, Europa Universalis 4. Uh, and uh, you can see the small town uh, here, like on the map, uh, it's like Timbuktu like, it looks a bit like Timbuktu, if you remember, I saw, showed at the beginning. Uh, it's nice that they put this, but then every single Afri city in Africa you build uh, from all the way to South Africa is in this style. And I've showed you just like at least three different architectural styles only West Africa. So, you know, you realize this is an example in which the developers didn't make even a bit of an effort 
to go and look at Africa and see, okay, at least they could have created maybe a couple of regions within the continent and make a difference. It's very weird that every city within Europa Universalis looks like Timbuktu in Africa, which is a bit sad. And to be honest, because it's, it's made of mud, in the rainforest, with so much rain, it would melt in a couple of days. So it doesn't make a lot of sense as well. And this is just a picture of the previous uh, uh, palace of the king of the Oba of Benin. After it got looted and then burned by the ground uh, by the British, uh, end of 19th century, when they were conquering Nigeria, modern day Nigeria. So again, you cannot see none of the palaces I've shown you can be seen because they all got burned to the ground by the, and looted. So all the bronzes I showed you before, like these bronzes, sorry for that. Here they're all actually in London. So these pictures are from London uh, British Museum. They're not in Africa. So that's something to keep in mind as well. So uh, yeah, moving back last kingdom in the West, the Congo kingdom, so down. And uh, this is uh, just one quick thing I want to mention. Interesting because they were Christians. They got converted by the Portuguese in the Middle Ages. So they even have these medieval churches in the middle of Congo. This is a medieval church. You can see the ruins in Congo. You wouldn't know about it. Again, even if you want to go for something that's familiar to you, but with a twist, you can look, you know, Africa has some very fascinating uh, things. Uh, shout out to another kingdom in the West, uh, in modern day Cameroon. This is called the Kingdom, kingdom of Bamoon. Look at the architecture. Again, you're looking for inspiration for some different type of buildings. This, uh, this is, you know, very special, I think, the way the pillars are made and so on. And um, uh, the Germans came there because Cameroon was a German colony and offered to rebuild the palace. This is how it looks like today because the Germans felt they wanted to make it look nicer. So you can ask, ask me, if you ask me which one looked better, I don't know. You can guess what my opinion is. <laughs> Uh, a fascinating fact, uh, the Kingdom of Bamoon had its own alphabet in Cameroon, but when the French came after the Germans, they banned the alphabet as well. So now there's no palace, no alphabet, all of this is gone. Uh, so going back to the full map, moving to Southern Africa, uh, you can see there's you know, this interesting uh, red here, which is the emperor of uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, this is how it looks like. So these massive uh, rock towers. This is uh, kind of southern, Af modern day Zimbabwe called the country. The country took the name from this ancient city. Again, when the Europeans came there in the 19th century and discovered it, now I guess you're not going to be shocked anymore. They thought like, whoa, this must have been a lost tribe of Israel that left Israel, came here, they built this and then disappeared. Because of course, black Africans couldn't have built this. So, Massive uh, architecture, you know, really ancient civilization, but then, you know, they tried so hard to erase it from African consciousness. Other examples of local stone-based African architecture, again, not everything is made of mud or huts, you have stone buildings as well. Uh, this is another interesting inspiration uh, in modern day South Africa. Uh, the Ndbele have like really fascinating uh, huts with, paint, with, with painted walls. I think it's really cool. I think just Cool patterns in general to use what they do. It looks a bit like 80s. Uh, and um, just I want to mention it Zulu because we're talking about Southern Africa, very powerful um, uh, kingdom. Definitely look at them. I'm going to show you a brief video of Zulu, a Zulu dance to show you how different it is from the previous Dogon dance that we just saw. Before. One thing you notice, there's no masks whatsoever here. Clothing is very different, colors are very different, no masks. Masks are more a thing in West Africa, Central Africa, less in the South and East. Uh, the type of drums, uh, drumming is different. Of course, there's many dances within a culture, but just to give you a glimpse, like even if you're thinking, oh, People dancing around drums, very, very lots of differences if you start digging into it. Just a little thing I want to mention, again, mythologies. The Zulus have their own gods. I just want to call a shout out to Mbana Moana Vareza because she's the goddess of rain and fertility, but she's the goddess of beer as well. I mean, the Zulu have a goddess of beer. So like, if you're looking at religion, it's not the Nordics, it's not the, like the goddess of beer is in, 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 is in the Zulus, in South Africa, right? With the Zulus. So just keep in mind, like if you can miss out on really cool stuff and interesting inspiration if you don't uh, open a bit your horizons. 
So moving towards East Africa, getting soon to the end of kind of this journey uh, through the uh, continent and its, uh, its cultures. Again, I, I'm bombarding with like uh, shallow information just to give an introduction. Uh, so I'm going to be still fast. The Swahili coast is basically East Africa's coast. And uh, it's a very fascinating place because just like in Mali, it's a place where Islam and kind of more like traditional Black Africa meet and collide to some extent. You have some of the most ancient and fascinating uh, Muslim civiliz civilizations are from there. For instance, Zanzibar, f the famous island, is part of the Swahili coast. They had like interesting uh, legends and, and cities and, and history and so on. Uh, there's this place called Kilwa that for me was really, really interesting. It was one of the biggest cities of the Swahili coast. Now it's in ruins, but you can see how this is a these are the ruins of the main mosque. You can still see how large it was. And uh, this is a depiction from uh, Portuguese explorers in the 16th century, uh, showing you know how this massive, powerful city was so rich. And if you read the descriptions, it's very fascinating. They said like with these black, rich people with like tribal marks on their faces. And just reading about it is like so interesting and so different from. Uh, other rich cities you could read, read of uh, at the time. And the interior, so everything kind of behind the Swahili coast, for instance, is where the Maasai live, you know, many of these like more grasslands uh, people. And there's, there's the Great Lakes as well. So Uganda, Rwanda had like very famous kingdoms. Uh, and um, I'm not going to go too much in detail, but I'll make a couple of interesting examples. In, this is uh, some instruments that got lost from uh, the kingdom of Uganda, modern day Uganda. Because, you know, lots of stuff, as you can see, got lost uh, and, and was intentionally banned. This type of instrument is made with a specific type of pumpkin. You can see that shape is actually one fruit that uh, basically was lost because no one was planting this pumpkin anymore. And so no one could make these instruments anymore. So they had to look for a, a, an old lady, luckily, that had the seeds, last seeds hiding in a drawer to make, to plant these, uh, these uh, gourds, these pumpkins. Then they could dry them cut them and make these instruments and we managed to save kind of last minute just recently this whole art the whole sounds of this instrument and these are some old men who still knew how to play the instrument so there's um, a lot of culture that is kind of on the verge of disappearing as well so if you dig into it and it's really fascinating what you can do uh, researching and even you know helping to uh, these, these cultures to, to thrive her style i haven't spoken about her a lot but that's a whole because of the texture of many african people it, you know, this specific hairstyle in Rwanda, Amasunzu, could tell a lot about your social status, marital status, you know, you didn't need the ID, just you look at your hairstyle, it's like, oh, okay, I see, you know, like, it would just say a lot uh, about you. And again, cool inspiration and aesthetics. Ethiopia, very fascinating part of the continent because it basically wasn't colonized, it was invaded but not colonized. It's interesting too because it was one of the most ancient uh, Christian kingdoms ever in the world, so it was Christian before, you know, many parts of Europe. And this has affected it in a different way than some of the re, you know, uh, neighboring parts of the continent. So you look at the royal court of the king of Ethiopia on the right, you can see it looks very different. On the left, the church that you can see was literally cut into stone. So they dug it into stone, it's made of one block of stone. So really fascinating and different things. Again, potentially interesting inspirations. But within Ethiopia, these are other people. These are people from Mursi, people from the Omo Valley, very different, like they are not Christians, they have their own religion, look at the clothing they have, even till nowadays they still dress like this and have scarifications. One of them has like you know, this uh, mouth plate on her lower lip, uh, maybe you can see it. So same country, again, imagine the difference. So imagine again, like uh, people in Köln going to church and people in, I don't know, Brandenburg, like living in the forest with mouth plates, scarifications, chasing wolves, I don't know. Like so again, very wide variety, within the same country. That's something always to keep in mind when looking into Africa. Small fun fact, uh, Ethiopia has had coffees in the Middle Ages. You want, if you want to have coffee in a, in a fantasy game, for instance, you can have it, you know, if you look a bit at uh, African inspiration. Um, so uh, that part of the journey of like looking into different cultures to get an introduction uh, ends here. And I'm going to briefly talk about uh, methodology a bit on how to research. Uh, and continue this journey by yourself. I'm going to talk about colonialism as well, because as you notice, when I speak about research, looking at uh, Africa's past, I've already, you know, I couldn't avoid this topic. And um, this picture, by the way, is from actually German colonialism uh, in uh, Southern Africa.
And uh, Germany was, uh, and I need to mention this because we're all currently sitting in Germany, was very important in understanding what happened to Africa. And when you're creating a game and taking some elements from Africa, you know, lots of the colonialism that makes it so hard to discover stuff started in Berlin. So there was a conference in Berlin, end of the 19th century, and major powers, which is always, you know, middle-aged white men, got together and then said, like, this is how we're going to split the continent. And they literally draw lines and created the countries that mostly you see today on the map. So they didn't develop organically like in Europe. And this is very important because you look at a country like Nigeria, most populous country of Africa. And this here, actually, this map here has three different countries. It has the country of Benin, that you see here on the left, it has Cameroon, that here on the right, and then it has Nigeria in the middle. Benin on the left was French, Cameroon on the south was German, Nigeria British. But the people were not this divided in a sensible way. So you can see the Yorubas are spread between Benin and Nigeria. And if you look at the Hausa, are basically all over. They're in northern Benin, northern Nigeria, northern Cameroon, and even in other countries. So it's very much a mess. So imagine like if Europe had been split into like, uh, like the Germans were like halfway in France, halfway in Italy, halfway in Poland, like basically that's what happened, you know. So it's very, so if you're looking for German culture, which country do you look at? That's different. So that's something to keep in mind. You have to look at cultures and not at borders when you're looking at prehistoric, pre-colonial, sorry, uh, Africa. And the thing to keep in mind is like Wikipedia is not so useful. I know in general university, you shouldn't be using Wikipedia for everything, like I think in theory, but I know you do, you know, I know I did. <laughs> But keep in mind that uh, Wikipedia, I mean, I haven't said this, uh, by the way, you can cut, you can cut this, Linus, okay? And um, uh, keep in mind that Wikipedia too is biased. So the same white middle-aged man, man that, you know, sub divided Africa in the 19th century, they are writing Wikipedia as well, you know? Of course, they're not the same people, but there is a bias. So if you try and Google some tiny German city in, from France, you find like maybe two pages, you try and Google a massive empire in Africa, you might find one line. There's a reason, right? And uh, yeah, here, there you go. Middle-aged white guys, uh, diversity problems. Let's see, yeah, there you go. That's why books are really, really useful. Like, uh, I know, yeah, <laughs> I know it's some obvious for some people, but you know, so if you're doing research for your video game, even if it's a video game, books, old-fashioned books are awesome. I really recommend them. And even just, not just for colonial Africa, for other stuff as well, you know, like uh, other topics that you're researching into. But Africa makes it, really blatant. Other thing, languages. You know, most of us here, I'm assuming, are not native English speakers. That's great. You speak German, you speak other languages maybe, and use them. Like for Africa, for instance, English is just one of the languages, official languages. There's French, uh, it's really big, there's Portuguese, and so, so Arabic. So if you know any of these languages, or even can use Google Translate, which is really powerful, have a look at stuff in other languages. Often you'll find like really cool material rather than just Google in English. Uh, which a lot of Anglophones, that's less of an issue for us, but I think I've noticed myself, I Google a lot in English nowadays. And that's a pity because, you know, you can find cool stuff in other languages and just translate it on Google. So there you go. Can you see like uh, internet bias pro English, but then uh, a lot of uh, other languages disappear, but they have lots of cool material on Africa. And um, uh, other one to keep in mind, uh, journals, really awesome. I've used journals not just in researching Africa, but researching other topics for games. Uh, they have amazing work by researchers, uh, in this case about Africa, but it can be about game theory or other things. So again, journals are really cool. And usually you can download a few uh, journals for free, like you don't have to pay. Uh, I think there's a limit sometimes, or you have to accept getting spam in exchange, but it's a fair deal. You get spam and in exchange, you get like really cool access to cool journals. Another one here below is uh, museums because so much stuff got stolen and taken into European museums. Just going through muse British museum, French museum, so you can find like really cool stuff about cultures that are non-European, in this case, African. Uh, movies as well, like uh, this one uh, is a really beautiful uh, Malian film. Uh, I was a bit scared when I went to watch it because I thought like, oh my God, this is going to be so art house, so boring. I don't know, but I want to watch it just because I need to, I need to learn. And actually, I enjoyed it. It was very interesting. It's not the Lord of the Rings, keep this in mind, <laughs> but it's a very interesting, strange indie version of the Lord of the Rings set in Africa based on a real myth, myth, myth like one of these uh, ancient epics uh, of Mali. Uh, 
again, I spoke about, I mentioned colonialism. I need to say that um, not just ancient colonialism, but even modern day catastrophes are still affecting the continent. So this actually picture here is a mausoleum uh, in Timbuktu, so the first city I showed, of a saint from the Middle Ages, and it got destroyed recently when uh, like Muslim uh, kind of jihadists, integralists, invaded uh, Timbuktu. It happened a few years ago, and they destroyed most of the mausoleums of Timbuktu because they said this was uh, idols. It was not like real Islam. And so these things have been standing, buildings have been standing for hundreds of years, and they destroyed them, destroy them with bulldozers, which was really, for a city like, like Timbuktu, that's basically like, a, you know, a, a little Heidelberg of, of the Middle Ages for, for Africa, that was really a disaster. And this sadly is still happening. Like nowadays, look at this news, there is 2018, people are destroying shrines and temples of traditional religions, for instance, uh, across the continent. So here, Man of God is a great shrine. It's like, this is a priest burning an ancient oracle in Nigeria. Again, this is recent, like a couple of years ago. Again, 2014, woman destroying another shrine. So someone put a bomb into, like how did they even get a bomb to put it into a shrine? I don't know, but it's really, so imagine like, if this were happening in Europe, people would be going, like Europeans would be going around churches, for instance, or old buildings and burning them and putting bombs and stuff. Why this is colonialism? Because there's been such an effort to demean African cultures, to say that African cultures are the devil, they're uncivilized, but even many Africans themselves believe it. And they're still nowadays making an effort to destroy many of the heritage. So colonialism is a big problem. Like being colonized is not something that happened in the past that we should forget about, it's not our problem anymore. It's still ravaging the culture of the continent. And that's why if you make a game uh, and you decide to ignore completely for uh, Africa, you know, maybe you have a great reason to focus, of course, making a game on like Norse culture, but you know, lots of people are making games of Norse culture. So have a look, maybe you could do something that's a bit more uh, interesting. And if you do that, you might be even fighting back against this, you know, the, the legacy of colonialism that started here in Europe and has affected uh, African cultures. There's games being made in Africa, a big obstacle, it's uh, of course the economy that is still much smaller than uh, Western economies, but they're growing. This is a Cameroonian uh, game uh, that was quite successful on Kickstarter and then on, on, uh, on Steam called Orion Legacy of the Corridan. They did a great job, possibly the first fantasy, single player fantasy game uh, based on African mythology out there. So really cool shout out to them. They're on Twitter, you can follow them. They're doing cool stuff and trying to do more. Even just supporting them can be a nice way, you know, to uh, help this part of our media to grow. So a few takeaway, takeaways. So one, first of all, just there's lots of obstacles. Just take, keep in mind, researching, if you want to do an, another Norse game, <laughs> another one, there's a lot of material out there. Of course, it's easy. If you want to do something inspired more by African mythologies or pre-colonial cultures, it's more work. Uh, search cultures, not nations. So it's, if you're looking for ancient history, don't Google Nigeria, Google Yoruba. Google Hausa, so look, at, look for the cultures. It's kind of like Googling Swiss language. There is no Swiss language. You have to Google German or French or Italian, right? And basically every African country is a Switzerland because of how Europeans uh, devised it. Uh, Wikipedia is not enough, so I'm not going to comment further. It's pretty obvious, especially for Africa. Like, according to Wikipedia, lots of Africa doesn't exist, basically. So keep this in mind. Try other languages if you can. Google Translate is awesome, just use it. Be creative, you know, try things, go and look at museums. There's Berlin had recently a really awesome exhibition on, uh, on like they're comparing like European uh, sculptures and African sculptures. It was really, really cool and really uh, interesting. And uh, you know, maybe there's cool movies, videos, stuff, like just uh, have a look around. These are just uh, some uh, concepts from the game I'm currently working on. It is called the Wagadu Chronicles, just to give you an idea of how we're getting inspired by pre-colonial Africa. And the artist, like she is Polish, called Iga, and so she was not born in Africa, she's not African, but she's just doing lots of research and doing an amazing work in bringing together this kind of Afro-fantasy setting with the rest of the team. So you don't have to be African to do something really cool with these cultures. Just you don't have to be Japanese to use samurais, right? Like samurais are part of our conscious, now we use Samurai, even just the, the tropes of samurai, just they're going there, opening a sword and everything falls apart. It's very clearly like a Japanese trope and now it's so, in, so deep 
And of course, we use it even like with some European knights. And that's why we should be having a bit more with African cultures and start getting stuff, some weapons and colors and, and music and so on. And someone who did this really well already like a century ago is Picasso. So this is Picasso surrounded by African art. This is like a century ago. And at the time, African art was kept in museums like in the Trocadero in Paris, for instance, and it was described as savage tools, examples of savage tools. It was not even called art. It was called savagery. But he, as a genius, walked into the museum and was like, whoa, this is awesome. This is art. And actually, I'm going to use this as an inspiration to improve my own art. So he didn't want to make African art, African painting, but he wanted to improve his own style. And basically, look at this. Cubism was born. So he, he did the white homework. He did what, what I was showing you today. He went to research and African art inspired a lot and sometimes literally one-to-one. -one. Look at the example I'm showing you there. But many people don't think about it like, oh, uh, like, you know, Picasso is like a great African artist. They think about him like a great European artist, but he wouldn't be where he, where he was if he hadn't spent a lot of time researching African art. Because again, color palette, lots of options. Don't get stuck on Michelangelo, uh, Paris, Fra you know, London, um, Berlin, Rome, and so on. Uh, and, our, and our Thor, and you don't just get stuck with or Odin and Thor. Have a look at Shango if you're thinking about a god, you know, a pantheon uh, or another Yoruba god and so on. And uh, that's it. I hope that was useful. Thanks uh, for uh, following. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. That was great, especially uh, how you talked it talked about it it feels like, felt like really inspiring um i'm glad thanks what i would really be interested in in the beginning you already said like stated uh, where you have worked but w what about geographical wise like wh where have you been so far where have you lived and what was your journey so i was born in italy and i spent like most of i mean as a kid i lived mostly there i lived a bit in ghana and hamburg as well as a kid but mostly in italy then i moved to hamburg uh Dublin in Ireland, Accra in Ghana, and Berlin, no sorry, in France as well, in Grenoble, and then Berlin. And I've been in Berlin for seven years. I think you're muted. Yeah, that's crazy, <laughs> nice. <laughs> so I can see some flashing, is that questions maybe? Yeah. No, just for now it's clapping, oh, yeah. does anyone, okay. Okay. Uh, cool. someone any questions? Yeah, um, exactly. Feel free to talk. Or raise your hand. People... You're, you're, you're welcome, uh, Yvette and Jan. <laughs> hey. Uh, Hello. I, I will start. Uh, hi. <laughs> hi. Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you for your uh, presentation, Ellen. It was really interesting. Uh, oh, but I have one uh, question because um, for me, it feels a bit difficult from the wide perspective I have or let uh, a group when the group is uh, just out of uh, um, only white guys, you know, mm -hmm. and then I would try to uh, take cultural things from the African uh, continent. How, how do my, uh, how do I make sure that it is still well represented with uh, re respect. Um, do you have yeah. any recommendations how I make sure that it is not reproducing any stereotypes and so on? That's a very great question. So um, mm -hmm. thank you. And um, uh, I think this, I have some good examples uh, of this. So my tip would be, first of all, okay, just to do a bit of research. So when you start doing research already, you go from like just copy pasting the first thing that appears on Google to like, you know, knowing a bit more. And then, you know, there's a topic that you know, I have in touch, but I think this is a great question to mention that is cultural appropriation. So especially in the U.S., there's a big debate around, uh, you know, indigenous cultures are being stolen by people, uh, white people, you know. And, and because if you look at the image I've shown you before, you know, like the, lots of the art was physically stolen and the, the temples and the palaces were burned and kind of taken to Europe or to the US. So there is a history of like, and of like destroying and taking away from these cultures. And uh, also straight away, beware because there's a minority of people of color that think that because you're white, you should have nothing to do with, you know, other cultures because 
you, you don't deserve it kind of like after what you did you know say like you as a, <laughs> i know you were not alive and none of us was but this is extreme so i think like we should be careful not to let that this part of the de debate hijack everything because the majority of people of color like me you know and most others are spoken with and people in africa and so on like was our pro the problem is cultural oblivion like we're not represented no one cares about us so i think we should be careful sometimes to the u.s debate you know, and social media especially like, kind of highlights things in a crazy way. So sometimes people go like, oh, the problem is people are stealing cultures. It's like, well, I don't know. If I look at most movies out there, I don't see people stealing black people cultures and, and stealing black gods and everything. It's not really the problem. The problem is, yes, sometimes there is racism and disrespect. For instance, uh, if there's any Dutch person in the chat, I'm sorry, but like the Schwarz Peter thing of like the black face that they do is really, that's, that is racist and wrong. But most of the problem is usually cultural oblivion, annihilation. And so if you make an effort as a white person to say, hey, I want to have a bit of black culture in my, my game, in my piece of media, you're doing a good thing, you're helping. And how to avoid being offensive or kind of like, as you're saying, you know, like good question, is research one, one thing I recommend really helps is get in touch with someone, you know, who's related somehow. Like look at in your school, because we have African studies, right? Like anyone there, mm -hmm. involve them. I get them like, hey, and for them, it could be cool to do something with you and share some know-how, do some brainstorm. And then you can mention it clearly. And on, it does two things. On one hand, you get real knowledge, real information from, and cool insights. On the other hand, it shields you a bit from the accusations of cultural appropriation because you're not saying like, hey, you just jumped in, Googled it and say, oh, I'm representing the whole of Africa as a white man. No, that's not true because you did research. And look, you even have, can show that you actually went to real people of color, and got some insights from them and experts and so on. So I'm not saying this is easy, but I think it's easier than they make it sound. Okay, thank you. So you welcome. And uh, you are welcome, Stefan and uh, Jena. I hope I pronounced the names correctly. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. sounds good, sounds good. Does anyone else have a, a question? Uh, yes, me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> hey. Hi. Hey. So, um, when you did the research for your game, like doing doing research here in Germany or in our like European um, culture or even in the internet, like you said, it's mostly like ninety percent white uh, middle aged ma uh, male men, and even like the historical um, the the research like we did um, from the um, oh my God, now I forgot the word, but um, like researching in books and everything in libraries. So yeah. most most of the sources are still from um, from colonial Africa, so and from colonial sources. Um, especially like from priests and um, soldiers and even like the anthropologists who um, used to go there were mainly like um, British, French and German and they were like paid by the government. So yeah. I guess it's not always like what you want to hear or like, like it's not how it, how it really was, but it was still from like a Western perspective. So especially for your game, like how did you make sure to just like combine it or how to get like a high percentage of um, the real world or like the real historical effects? Yeah. Very good question. Again, thanks. And uh, absolutely, like I've read a number of 19th century books as well, uh, because most of that, like you can find, by the way, for free, like a lot of books from, I think every book from the 19th century is not under copyright anymore, I think. So there's like this, it's called Internet Archive or Book Archive. You can find like, if you put like, um, I don't know, 1880s or 1890s, and then you put like Africa or specific countries or something or the name of the colonies, you'll find a lot of cool books and uh, of, uh, with pictures, especially like really cool. Many of them have a lot of interesting drawings of like explorers who went there and that's already, the drawings, luckily they're not very biased because they're just drawings, you know, like, I mean, of course they can try and make people look more ugly. I don't know, but it's like, but especially the written part, yes, I agree. There's a lot of bias and um, it's really sometimes painful for me to, you know, I really read of like my ancestors in Ghana uh, it was called Gold Coast at the time, the colony. And then, you know, I like, remember there's this guy that was going like, yeah, actually for this priestess, for a black woman, she was even not that ugly, like stuff like this, you no, know, really very blatantly like insulting, right? Like just saying these people are savages. So, but then I think the trick is to go, do you know the racism at the time, the difference between modern day racism and then, it used to be so blatant, so open, that it's kind of easier to see where it is as well. I think sometimes today you're like not sure is this racist, is this not. Sometimes they're like, oh yeah, everybody was ugly, but then this and this and this. Sometimes it can really just like it's easier to split. So I'd say do look at those sources because you'll find like interesting 
uh, drawings uh, and even like sometimes you find maybe like you find something say oh like they ate people alive it's like hmm that's suspicious but at least you find this name and you go and look for it somewhere else you see okay this is the correct thing in a paper or something but I'll say like I found like when I've read those books that more than half of it was really interesting and usually the racist part is pretty clear so I still think I can still recommend them and it's quite easy to avoid because when it said something outlandishly insulting it's usually racist it's quite it's, it's easier than it seems to avoid those parts but it's good to have that mindset to be worried. I mean, if you walk in thinking, oh, that's accurate, then yeah, you're in for a big mistake, then you're in trouble. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, why right, thank you for a question. Cool. Yeah, okay, so I think it seems like everybody is happy. <laughs> cool, great. <laughs> Yes. And of course, too, if you have like in any, uh, I mean, I'm a busy man working on a game, but <laughs> if you have any questions around the game or something like you're lost, let me know. I mean, I'm happy to help. I mean, uh, as much as I can, I might not reply on the same on the moment as you write to me, but get in touch on Twitter and maybe I can even give you some links, some book or something. I'm super happy to help you, you know, if you want to do a bit more research on the topic. I think that's awesome.